after a year of intense work, uh, Professor Knut Lind will um, 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 give uh, give a presentation together with uh, a panel uh, analyzing the findings. Um, Professor Lind has since 2006 been the Professor of Innovation Economics at the Technical University of Berlin. In addition to his academic role, he's uh, the coordinator of the Business Unit for Regulation and Innovation at Fraunhofer ISI. Uh, it sure will be a challenge to present and discuss the findings as the report is extensive. But um, uh, if somebody can do it, it's uh, Knut. So Knut, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, uh, Astor. I'm quite excited to share with you the, the results of um, the study. And uh, just to, uh, to be a little bit, yeah, and welcome to almost 300 attendees. Um, just, uh, I remember that I was, I think it was around 26, uh, 2006, uh, uh, attending the, the presentation of the study results by Richard Gosch uh, uh, and the, a team uh, kind of yeah, put together by Merit. Uh, it was in a small room at, at the European Commission's uh, kind of premises and uh, now uh, we, we are here 15 years later um, with a kind of an update and maybe also some, some new avenues regarding open source software and open source hardware. Um, I have to then, uh, for, uh, so, um, yeah, I have not much time, uh, 20 minutes to talk about the economic impact and the impact beyond open source software and hardware collected by a team um, uh, by the colleagues of Open Forum Europe and um, and then Mirko Bremer and Andrew Katz, you will hear later, but I, uh, like to thank especially uh, Stephen Page and, and Paula for, for their great work. Um, and after my um, talk, uh, Sachi Kogmuto will then present you only a few policy recommendations. Overall, we, I think, collected more than 30 that each will kind of highlighting the, the most relevant um, recommendations, uh, which also Commissioner Breton kind of asked us to, to deliver. Um, and. Uh, the plan was really to present the results uh, uh, here at, at this uh, 5th of February, already last last uh, February, but uh, there we didn't know what kind of would, would happen in 2020. Therefore, it was even or it's even more great achievement to have now uh, this opportunity to present uh, these results uh, going through the whole uh, COVID um, uh, uh, crisis and, and challenges. And um, before I, I'm going to start, uh, I'd like to, to acknowledge also the, the, the great support by uh, Frank Nagel from the Harvard Business School. I, I will mention him, him later um, because he uh, was also very helpful during the last year. Also, the, the, the different and many experts and their, their different support by the OFE experts group. Um, the interviewees, um, uh, we, we, we talked to the respondents to the stakeholder survey, but also uh, last and I think more important, most important, Odyssey has and Louis from DigiConnect who uh, are kind of uh, uh, responsible for, for kind of accompanying us uh, through uh, this study. Um, and they, they gave us these uh, five tasks. Um, it means first, uh, and this is kind of the focus of my brief talk about the economic impact of open source soft but also hardware. And then the colleagues uh, from OFE, they did some policy analysis uh, of policies in the EU, um, in different member states, but also at the commission's level and worldwide. Uh, and uh, we do not have time to uh, present uh, this work, but this more or less implicitly goes into the policy recommendation. And then we have task four, the case study analysis here uh, in the panel, uh, Mirko and Andrew will talk about. And all this then went into the division of uh, policy recommendations. Um, we kind of translated that a little bit into a, a different methodological approach. That means we really looked at the literature, um, which has been kind of collected or augmented in the last uh, 20 years. We looked at what data is available, and then this is the basis both for the impact assessment, but also for drafting the questionnaire for the stakeholder survey, because there are different other surveys running. and. Uh, the Linux Foundation was already mentioned. They had a, a, la, a big survey also last year. Then we have these case studies um, where we do not have much time to talk about, but here later, Mirko and Andrew I will talk about. And then, as I mentioned, these analysis of policy initiatives and all this went into a kind of a comprehensive analysis. 
and a large set of recommendations. Um, what's the overall approach we, we choose? Uh, this is kind of a, um, a two-sided approach. We look first at the cost, what, what do uh, companies and countries invest in the development of open source software. It means here we focus on, on software and not on um, hardware, um, because this is a kind of a case-based approach we have chosen for that. And um, we do, do that on country and also company level, looking at the, the most active companies. Um, and also we had some information from the stakeholder service and other service plus the case studies. And then we compare that also with, with the benefits. We, we do that on the one hand at macro level with the macroeconomic growth model and, and an analysis of the contributions of open source software to the GDP in the EU. And we also do that on the company level. Um, here we derive on results from the stakeholder survey, but other, other surveys like um, here in uh, Germany, the Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin um, kind of started the open source monitor also last year with a representative uh, survey of companies. And we kind of cross validate uh, these different approaches in order then to come up with the figures which are uh, at least um, kind of uh, yeah, validated from different perspectives in order to be kind of really uh, serious. Uh, the data sources here um, regarding open source software, it's, it's uh, uh, GitHub, it's also used by Frank Nagel and others in different studies because here we have uh, millions of users, uh, billions of comments, uh, links to organizations uh, and country codes, uh, which makes these country uh, and EU kind of uh, based study possible. Then, then we combine that with data from the OECD, the OECD patent office, because they're also responsible for trademarks, Crunchbase, Amadeus, the company data sets, and, and various other data sources. Um, Looking at the developments in the last 10 years, uh, it's a continuous kind of growth of, of comets to, to GitHub. Um, and here, especially Germany and the UK, but also Falco and France are, are quite active. These are the, the, the comets, but maybe here uh, are the, the contributors uh, where we see a lot of the stagnation after uh, 2017, 2018, it's, it's stable. Overall, uh, here we have uh, more than 30 um, million comets and uh, 20, uh, uh, 250,000 uh, contributors. I will come back to these figures later. Now, um, this cost-based impact assessment is um, more or less I know, a baseline approach to, to really kind of start with what, what are the efforts, uh, both on the country level um, here in the in the EU, that means the member states, but also then we sampled the around 2,000 most active companies and organizations uh, which are located with headquarters in the EU and looked at their efforts. And these are kind of lower bound assessments because, as I uh, already mentioned, um, we cannot kind of attribute every contributor and every commit to kind of an EU member states or the EU. We are, we are missing probably 50% of that. And the basic approach or assumption beyond this approach, uh, this goes back also to uh, work by uh, Nordhaus, he's a Nobel Prize winner, about the, the assessment to value public goods uh, and also other intangibles there where you look at the cost side and you say, okay, these, these investments are at least kind of a minimum uh, benefit you can expect. Yeah? And uh, that's, that's the, the, the baseline approach we took. And what, what did it found? Um, overall, we have around 3 million employees in the computer programming sector in the EU. And um, in, in our analysis, we found uh, 260,000 contributors to GitHub, which are kind of located uh, to the EU. That means this might be more. And these are slightly uh, less than 10% of these uh, people uh, employed in the computer uh, programming sector. However, it is, it's clear that also other sectors contribute to open source, but nevertheless, uh, this is the, the most important sector. If we then look at the, the cost, um, uh, in order to hire or pay these people, this then amounts in 2018 to 14 billion. On the other hand, we also looked then at, at the comets and um, used a kind of also well-established model to uh, calculate the so-called full-time equivalents needed to produce these comets. And here we come up to 16,000 full-time equivalents, um, which in order to, to pay them, um, 
uh, we need uh, more or less more than 1 million uh, euro, uh, uh, billion euro in, in the EU in 2018. These are the, the baseline uh, um, calculations from, from the cost perspective on the macro level. Um, then, as I said, we, we identified the most active companies which had a headquarter in the EU, and, um, and they um, are responsible for more than 10% than, uh, of the contributors and uh, even for one third of all the comets coming from the EU, and they employ more than 1 million uh, employees. Uh, and what we see, and that's, that's, uh, that's also a very important kind of finding, which is then also becoming relevant for the policy recommendations, is that we see uh, in Europe a very high share of small companies which are really most active in, in participating and contributing to, uh, to open source. That means more than 75% of these companies have less than 100 employees. That means we are uh, here in the kind of SME or even in the micro company uh, sector, uh, where we find most active companies. And uh, the, the smaller the companies, the more contributors they are, they are listing and the more commits they, they provide. Uh, that's, uh, that, that means overall, we, we see that in the sample of the most active companies, um, between 1,100 employees, that they invest more than 5% of their full-time equivalents in contributing to open source. And overall, if we, if we put the, the macro and the, 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 the company-based figures regarding cost together, uh, we find quite valid and, and reasonable and uh, kind of sensitive uh, results. That means on the cost level, I think that's um, a, a fair uh, picture. Now at the benefit level, uh, it's a little more challenging. Um, here we, we kind of run a, a growth model and uh, include besides R&D and, and other kind of indicators for technological um, progress, also uh, the contributions to open source. And we find that um, between 2017 18, that the, the contributions are 0.4% of GDP in the EU. If we then take the total number, then we, we come up to uh, 36 uh, billion per year. Uh, that's the um, based on the on on the comments, if we take uh, the the contributors as a specific kind of uh, subgroup of the of the labor force, uh, it uh, goes even up then to uh, 50, 95 billion per year. It means overall the EU economy is significantly benefiting uh, from open source, um, and in the future one could say uh, probably that uh, by increasing the this activity by 10% per year, um, additional 100 billion uh, GDP per year can be expected. In order to put this figure a little bit in context with a little my, my other history on sanitization, uh, uh, we did some studies on the contribution of sanitization for the German economy 20 years ago, and we find that the German economy benefits 15 billion per year by the, the standardization work, which is uh, not the same than open source, but, but a, a, sometimes a, a, or in some dimensions, some kind of similar uh, mechanism. That means uh, also in this context, these figures are uh, nicely put in context. That means that's the, the, the benefit uh, assessment on the, on, the, on the macro side. And um, if, we, if we put uh, this together and also taking into account that um, in 2018 uh, also significant kind of open source has been used, which have, has been produced before, also considering additional hardware cost, uh, which the contributors need, we come up with a cost benefit ratio to one to four. That means uh, one full-time equivalent uh, contributing to open source con generates additional uh, GDP of four times this cost. Uh, and, uh, uh, there are other studies uh, which look at the contribution of ICT hardware and also quite recently about innovation expenditure in, in general. And they find, especially the last study from the US, they find also a cost benefit ratio of the investment of one euro for our and D generates four additional uh, euros in GDP. Uh, and this is as, as a baseline, as a minimum level. That means also here we have quite consistent findings. Now, um, what we also did, and uh, again, thanks for uh, both the contributions to designing the stakeholder workshop, uh, survey, but also to, to contributing to uh, 
the, the kind of the, the response to, to it. Um, we, we did that uh, last, um, yeah, from September to November. Uh, the, the idea was to, to gather and uh, further views on the impact of open source software, but also here on hardware. That means the previous figures are not uh, covering the, the, the hardware story. Um, and also to fill some gaps uh, which are from in the literature not covered, the, the existing data is not really kind of uh, providing, and also the case studies uh, Mirko Böhm and Andrew Katz conducted uh, didn't fulfill, then we thought uh, we, we might also then uh, use the stakeholder survey in order to, to close these gaps. And uh, in order to really create a robust empirical representation of all the opinions and issues at stake, that means also taking all different stakeholders uh, into account, not only industry, that means companies, but also research organizations, the public sector, um, NGOs, and, and even foundations. Uh, and uh, this, as uh, presented at the very beginning, is contributing then to the, the derivation of policy recommendations. Overall, um, uh, with the help also uh, by the colleagues from the European Commission, several open source organizations, including foundations, uh, we got overall 900, more than 900 responses who, who are at least partly answered the question. Yes. That means that the, the more sensitive uh, issues about kind of uh, profits and turnovers, um, they hear the responses is a little bit significantly low. Now, what, what are the major findings? Um, which are also from uh, their character a little bit complementary to these hard cost figures. Um, why are uh, yeah, organizations in general contributing to open source software and hardware? Although I have to say uh, the responses from the hardware community were, were quite limited. Therefore, the findings are, uh, I think, uh, representative for the software sector, but not necessarily for the hardware sector. We come back to the hardware sector later. Um, what are the major, major incentives? It's about finding technical solutions, but also carrying forward the state of the art of technology that needs uh, contributed to technical progress is, is uh, very important. And, uh, and also, and this is uh, also from a macro and political perspective, uh, an important um, aspect is to avoid uh, the lock-in into specific vendors. Uh, that's, that's, that's also uh, on the top kind of uh, yeah, incentives. Um, uh, on the fourth and fifth uh, position, it's about knowledge seeking and knowledge creation. That means uh, the, the reflecting the principle of, of, of open source um, par excellence. Now, looking at the benefits, uh, what are the benefits? And here, um, uh, open source provides open standards and interoperability. Uh, and in a connected world, these are, um, or especially interoperability, uh, maybe kind of realized by open standards is uh, is key and this is becoming even more important uh, by the way we did some other studies where we found that meanwhile patents do not contribute anymore too much uh, or to gdp but but standards are still doing that and are having even an increasing relevance and this is also reflected by this assessment then the access to source code and again the independence from propriety providers of software uh, we also asked for the, the cost aspects uh, because maybe there are some additional cost aspects we, uh, we, we missed in our cost-based uh, impact assessment. Overall, the different cost aspects are less relevant. However, the issue of stability and, and, and error accessibility are important. And also what, what's key uh, is uh, the cost for skilled labor to, to contribute and use open source. And this is uh, also, again, coming back to the Bitcoin survey, a very important um, challenge. And uh, this will be also then later reflected in the um, uh, policy recommendation because uh, the, this, the, the shortage of skilled labor is, is an issue. Now, we also asked then for a cost benefit ratio just to, to validate um, what we have found on uh, with this more quantitative uh, approach here, just to get the uh, the, the, the gut feeling from the, the respondents and overall we, we, we see that the majority of the respondents see at least high benefits and only medium costs related to open source software and hardware and then we all even ask for a specific number and then here uh, the, the people have a kind of a, the assessment of 1 to 10 which is, which is higher than the, the presented before but this is probably also to some subjectivity bias. That means these are the main results of the of the stakeholder uh, survey. Normally, a little bit faster than, than anticipated. 
Um, overall, what we see is uh, Europe is really making heavy investments into open source. Also, uh, the, the companies uh, who are like, located with the headquarters in Europe are making really a, a major, major kind of investments um, and only kind of taking the labor cost uh, for the full time equivalents is, is 1 billion. If you take the contributors, is 15 million, billion per year in 2018. Um, and this is a little bit different than what we see for the US, where here the big tech companies are the major contributors. And we do not see uh, kind of this very high share of, of, of small players. Uh, um, looking at the benefit side, as I said before, based on some macroeconomic uh, calculations, we could uh, see for the future an additional kind of 100 billion uh, euros in GDP per year uh, with uh, an increase uh, or driven by an increase of 10% of more, more comets or 10% more contributors to open source. And um, as a third bullet, which I didn't kind of uh, introduce so far, um, Frank Nagel and, and colleagues, they, they did a study on the role of open source for, for ICT startups on a global level. And uh, based on their findings, it was possible then to calculate the contributions of open source uh, to startups in, in the EU. And uh, what, uh, taking their, their approach and their figures, what we find here that again, a 10% increase in the kind of contribution to open source would uh, create additional 1,000 ICT, ICT startups per year. And that's, that's very important um, because here we also see uh, quite a shortage. I just saw yesterday some figures from Germany in the last uh, 10 years, the, the kind of startup development really was uh, slightly decreasing and it's not really the recovery. We also see, and this is uh, from the case studies and, and later in the panel, maybe uh, Andrew and Mikko uh, can talk about uh, this a little bit more, is that the total cost of ownership in the public sector can be reduced regarding software and especially the avoidance of vendor lock-in uh, on the micro level, but also the contribution uh, of open source to uh, increase or assure digital autonomy is a very important aspect. Overall, the benefits are of open source are related to openness, including the contribution to open standards, independence, and also labor cost savings. Uh, that's also a very important aspect uh, which drives uh, the, the benefits of, of open source, but which also is an important driver for companies to, to get involved. And, and, and overall, it's not so much about uh, generating additional revenue. That was very short, very condensed, and maybe too fast, the summary of the main results uh, from the one part of the study uh, later will be then presented by Sashiko. So now let's see. Okay, uh, thank you, Knut. Um, uh, and also thank you to everybody uh, contributing in the chat. I hope we have a way to capture all the comments. These are still useful. We are still um, there, you know, working on agreeing the final report. And so there might be uh, an opportunity to take into account some of these uh, comments. So thank you for, for adding also an element of liveliness to, to, the, to the event. Now, um, the commissioner asked us uh, just now to focus on what brings value to Europe. and. We also talked about open source as an idea that has turned into um, to multiple success stories now. And for someone who has believed in and promoted the idea of open for over 10 years, I have to say it's great to see um, the value that open source contributes to the European economy quantified in this way. So um, this is really exciting. Now, Indeed, an important task in the study consists of formulating policy recommendations. And um, I feel here the need to make the point that Knut's presentation really shows that there is a significant impact of open source to the GDP of the EU, uh, which justifies a scaling up of policy intervention to support uh, open source software and hardware in all sectors of the economy and, and public administration as well. Um, in uh, our study, um, the recommendations are conceptually organized around the different functions of innovation systems. Um, they have been 
discussed with practitioners from the public sector uh, in, in an online workshop and also um, discussed with our, with our experts and where necessary have been adapted. Now, given the time constraints today, Knut had you know, a short time to present uh, the, the study. I have an even uh, shorter time to, to give you a glimpse into some of these areas of recommendations. In total, uh, in the study, they are over, there are over 30 of them. Uh, and we have there strived to make the recommendations specific and actionable. Uh, and of course, they are much more fully uh, elaborated in the final report. So I apologize for sort of needing to rush through them. Uh, I hope it doesn't seem that they are not uh, well-founded um, because of that. Um, as Astor already mentioned, there will be uh, further opportunities this year to discuss in more detail what we present here today. So um, again, I will focus only on the, the areas highlighted in the presentation. Now, the first one, and I want to really emphasize this, we consider that increasing the institutional capacity within the public sector related to open source software, especially, is a necessary condition to being able to implement all the other recommendations in the report. Uh, today, and I think this is important to say, the scale of Europe's aggregate in institutional capacity related to open source we think is disproportionately smaller than the total value created by open source. And um, that is to say that also we know the European Commission and others have initiated activities and programs in some of these areas um, that are um, that are valuable, um, but we need to scale this up to match the potential that open source has in growing uh, the economy. So. Um, and again, just highlighting one area where we feel that um, that the European Commission can take um, action uh, to 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 promote this is through um, the OSPO, so an open source program office. And uh, we have seen this emerging as a fundamental building block um, and a networking interface, uh, strengthening the institutional infrastructure of open source also in the in the private sector, I would say mainly. And so um, the European Commission has already created uh, an OSPO um, as part of its open source strategy. And we believe that um, the European Commission can play a leading role in also um, establishing uh, OSPOs in government institutions across Europe. Um, and uh, therefore, you know, we want to emphasize this, um, this way that, that the European Commission can play a leadership role um, by highlighting uh, some points, uh, mainly giving uh, the, the, the European OSPO an external networking component uh, and encouraging the building of uh, 20 or so OSPOs uh, throughout Europe, possibly through a pilot uh, funding program, um, and creating a, a network um, where these OSPOs can share best practices. And um, we think that um, in this way, um, OSPOs can play um, you know, an important role in encouraging that winning open source culture that uh, the commissioner was talking about. Now, um, another important slide, and I'm going to rush through, um, uh, through them here. Um, we have seen, um, again, the, what Knut presented, these uh, significant positive externalities that are generated by open source. Um, um, and which is also confirmed in other studies. And this um, recommends, uh, this, you know, it justifies us recommending level of public R&D funding of specific open source uh, software and open source hardware focused research. Um, you know, for example, in Horizon Europe. And the, the figure I'm showing there is that we can see that, um, um, if we focus specifically on SMEs, we think, we think that uh, such funding should focus, um, target mainly SMEs uh, or even micro enterprises and startups. Um, because of um, 
this um, this virtuous uh, R&D uh, funding cycle that we see here. So basically, if um, if public funding of R&D of SMEs um, con that can contribute to open source software, um, they, that in uh, would uh, you know would support um, uh, and and push the creation of further startups, which will then increase again the um, uh, the available source code um, uh, and, and and can benefit uh, society. Um, next slide, Sivan. I'm trying to move forward. Yeah, so an important part of, um, of uh, you know, um, an important function of an innovation system deals with human capital development. And here we see that um, a lack of skilled labor uh, does prevent companies from using and contributing to open source software in Europe. And so an important area to focus on will be uh, just the development of, of the skills needed um, to um, to be able to benefit um, uh, as a whole, um, and we we do recommend uh, we have specific specific recommendations how we can promote um, coding skills, but also at the entrepreneurial level um, skills um, to understand um, how you can build a company uh, and a viable business model uh, using open source. So we believe there's a sort of basic skills level that should be um, should be supported and also um, a sort of change in, in culture and, and, and just, um, I guess, um, um, a sort of further realization of, 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 of the opportunities that exist uh, working with open source. Um, and so, um, next slide, I'm going to try to wrap up quickly. Um, and so, creation of the legitimacy, um, this is fundamental for the breakthrough of uh, an emerging technological system, especially and now we're talking about open source hardware, uh, which is developing, but uh, also for the further development of established technologies like open source software. Now, we think that one opportunity to uh, increase um, the legitima legitimacy of open source is to further elaborate the role that open source can play in achieving uh, digital uh, autonomy or independence. I think uh, the, the commissioner used the word, actually the term technological independence. And um, we also uh, recommend um, other ways to create leg legitimacy for example, by integrating open source um, communities uh, more into uh, the European research and policy frameworks. Um, here we can maybe learn from, uh, from the world of standardization where SDOs are already well integrated into um, these policy frameworks, whereas for open source communities, uh, such integration is still at the beginning. Um, and um, we think that this can go beyond uh, research and innovation to also integrate um, open source further into Europe, the European Green Deal and uh, European Industrial Strategy. Um, and we might also consider um, public support of open source um, foundations um, that could be raised to a level comparable to the support provided to SDOs. Um, okay. Finally, uh, the regulatory environment. And again, uh, I'm sorry, um, I would like to go into these things in much more detail. Uh, but uh, one of the, the, looking again at innovation, uh, we know that um, high risk of liability uh, can hamper innovation. And we have seen this, I think, recently um, as obstacles to use um, and also to contribute to open source software and particularly uh, open source hardware in the area uh, of medical devices developed to tackle the challenges of COVID-19. And at the same time, there's a lot of opportunity in this area. So um, we recommend increasing uh, legal security by clarifying the liability regi regime, um, especially for individual, individual developers. Um, and of course, well, of course, ensuring the safety of users. Um, 
and skimming here really um we know the commission has um has a has a project that has been renewed also looking into Im improving um uh the security of open source software components that underlie you know um the critical infrastructure of, of Europe uh, and we would um, recommend scaling up this this activity um, and um, also in order to fully um, you know public procurement plays an important role uh, as we know in 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 Europe given the large size of the public sector and we believe and this is something that we've focused on quite for you know over a decade in in, in open forum europe but you know really uh, consider um open source in future revisions of the european public procurement directive and to develop guidelines for how to procure open source uh software um final slide We can just say that we think that um, you know the large economic impact of open source software and potential impact of emerging open source hardware it um, has been recognized by the European Commission but the scale needs to be um, be increased um, and um, and to look for coordination uh, across Europe and we think the Commission can play an important role there now, I hope I managed to um, whet your appetite a little bit um, by this glimpse into the policy recommendations of the study. And now to discuss this further, I am happy to be joined by other members of the research and for a discussion which is moderated by OFE's very own chairman and founder, Graham Taylor. It's great to have you uh, with us uh, today. Thanks, Achiko. Um, I hope everybody can hear me okay. So uh, if not, then somebody will shout at me, I'm sure. Um, but uh, hopefully I'm going to be joining four other people um, as well. As, well, Sorry, yeah, four other people as well as Achiko. So let's just see if we got them there. We got Mirko, great. Um, Anyhow, while we're getting those come up, um, just to say very much, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. I think it's a fantastic summit and the, the studies is, is superb as well. Um, it was, what, 2006 since the last study uh, was run. And uh, many of you remember Rishab Ghosh at that time. And of course, uh, Luke Surter, who's with us today, was uh, headed up that overall thing for Maastricht. So it's great to have Luke back here. He's been at a of our previous summits as well. Anyhow, my job in the next half hour maximum, I guess, I suspect Esther will try and cut me off a bit shorter than that, is to try and delve into some of the detail and a little bit more detail, um, go into some of the, the results of the study and try and draw uh, some of the, out some of the more the interesting aspects of the conclusions I think came. So let me just introduce though the two people or the three people that you haven't seen so far. Uh, first of all, Andrew Katz. Andrew is an Open Forum Academy fellow. Um, he's a, a lawyer and head of technology and CEO at the UK Law Forum of Moorcross. Moore but Andrew, in this study, has been focusing very much on the open source hardware aspects of the project. But again, many of you, in fact, most of you will know him with his background in open source. Mirko Berm is, again, very well known to everybody um, and is now open source ambassador at Daimler. Um, again, somebody very well known to everybody, I think, uh, listening in on, on the uh, summit today, um, and has taken really, I think, the leading role on some of the open source aspects of the study. Um, but as a guest, um, and not part of the study as such, as I said, is Luke Serta. Uh, Luke is now the honorary um, Professor of International Economics at Maastricht. As I said, uh, Luke has been involved in the whole economic uh, view of technology for many years. He's spoken with us before. Um, he was involved in that very first study that Sachiko uh, related to. Um, he's got a formidable background, I think, on economics. He was the uh, Rector Magnificus at Maastricht. He's still a member of many international organizations. Um, and I think particularly is looking at some of the 
um, economic aspects of technology and innovation. And speaking to him the other night, very much, I think, interested in some of the areas of open innovation. So for me, uh, that's a really good place to start. And perhaps, Luke, if you could just just talk a little bit about what you've seen in the changes in the whole view of uh, technology, of openness and innovation, and, and particularly open source impacts in those last 15 years. Um, and as I go, I've got some other specific questions, you know, to the other guys on, on the panel, please feel free to dive in as well. So let's try and get a little bit more of a discussion, great Q&A session. But look, perhaps you could just kick off with that as a topic and let's take it forward. Well, thanks, thanks very much, Graham. And it's, as somebody m remarked in the chat, the old guard is here. And to some extent, <laughs> I proof that there is now a clear history to open source. Uh, and that this is pretty fantastic to see, to be surrounded as old guys here by all these young researchers and young participants. Uh, it, just on your question, I would say that back in the 2005 and six, we felt, I must say, at that time, a little bit like David versus Goliath. Uh, and I still remember very much when we did the study on the economic impact of open source software. It was a fight. We need to, to convince public policymakers, uh, to convince the European Union also. And of course, we had opposed to us. We had, uh, there's no doubt about this, uh, the Goliath was Microsoft, so to say who focused, um, I think, in that debate, we, we used even the terms of open standards, much more than open source, to get to, to get the argument advanced. I would say over the last 15 years, the roles have been, to some extent, that David has become a goal yet itself, but not in a fight so much, but more, um, well, as, as you all know, the, the, the change on the, the Microsoft side of having once called uh, Linux a cancer, and now, um, Satya Nadella uh, calling Linux or being in love with Linux, etc., and being all in on open source. So I think this is, has been a tremendous change. And I think the study and the figures you highlighted, or which um, were emphasized by both Knut and uh, Sachiko, illustrate this enormous growth impact of what has happened over 15 years. So I think the situation is totally different uh, from that perspective. Uh, and I find it remarkable what has uh, what the study shows in terms of the economic impact of this 100 billion GDP impact, which is is really very impressive. If you look at the full impact of activity gains in, oh, in doing lost. with digital technologies. Thanks, Luke. Uh, you you've talked very much about the economic aspects, and that clearly has been the focus as well uh, what about the innovative aspects though the open innovation you know in terms of openness overall and how that uh, fits into that the thinking around that which is as much cultural i would suggest as it is technological yeah no i think this is a very good point i think if you look at the debates which as we have had them in europe in the um, particularly in the european commission we've had this debate on open science which was launched by another commissioner Commissioner on, on uh, Research and, and Innovation, uh, the previous one, Carlos Moidas. Uh, that has been enlarged from open science to open innovation. Uh, you see now Thierry Breton, uh, the commissioner who really called upon the impact of open source on, uh, he called it exactly, if I heard his words right, scrutinizing artificial intelligence, uh, developing this kind of this whole idea of technological, whatever, sovereignty, independence, you can debate about this, but at least to create a spirit of open innovation as it has become also popular in much uh, uh, European Commission writings. Why I think this is, is really as an idea, as a concept, and indeed as a culture is becoming rather crucial is that you could imagine that with the COVID-19 impact in the whole medical field, just imagine that we would have the open source principles applied in the medical field, which I'm sure will happen in post-corona time. There will be a new discussion about the way the whole medical sector and the, and the development of vaccines or development of other drugs is subject to a system which is completely at the opposite of open source. So I, I think that the open source community can show his insights in terms of revising the system of proprietary innovations as they exist in, in the extreme form, of course, in the medical field. 
Yeah. And we've seen a lot of that Not happening that. in the perspective of, of open hardware as well, uh, particularly as um, in, in, in the COVID perspective. So I, that, that's, uh, that, that's proved to be very, very interesting. People are having to learn very quickly about the ways that they can collaborate and also learning about the, uh, the friction that exists. And obviously, you know, one thing we need to do is to try to reduce that friction as much as possible. No, I think this is where open, look, the, uh, I think it's Harari who mentioned with respect to COVID-19, a scientific triumph and a political fiasco. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think the scientific triumph has been based on open science in the sense of the underlying, the, the exchange of data, the open access to data, etc. The political fiasco is in relationship to the today with respect to vaccine access, etc. And it's all to do with the way in which we don't have the access to the underlying technological knowledge, for instance, with respect to vaccine development. So I think the open source community has really a crucial role to play today mm -hmm. in the whole notion of open innovation. Yeah, absolutely. And I suppose some of the developments um, as far as um, open source program offices are, are concerned um, means that they can initially focus on um, open source, the understanding of open source that we have, but then gradually um, use that as a springboard to introduce other opens as well, which are relevant to that. So open governance, open hardware, open data, open science, and so on. So if an open source program office, for example, within an academic context becomes a real, um, uh, a, a real sort of center of, um, of, of information and dissemination, um, you know, that can be a very powerful thing. Yeah, that's something that, you know, the open source strategy of the European Commission, uh, you know, talks about quite a bit about how the, actually the, the experience of, 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 uh, of open source uh, working with open source communities has had this spillover effect um, for, you know, that has applied to the way that, um, you know, the European Commission works together in turn. And I think for us, uh, you know, with me, so we've always focused on this, uh, the more with the cultural aspects of open. Uh, I think that that's really interesting. And, and, and I think we, we, we need more of that. Uh, it's about, you know, building on uh, existing knowledge, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants, etc. Um, it will be better if we don't reinvent the wheel. Um, we have, you know, we lost our leader, but I think, you know, we have to prove now, you know, that the principles of self, you know, governing communities, <laughs> you know, uh, that it works. So, Graham, you're back. I'm back. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I don't know. I certainly lost all of you. So I apologize. I don't know where the problem was. <laughs> I want to so, extend on what Sachiko said. I think this kind of leads into this question of like, now that open source is very successful, um, what is what's what are the next steps? Like, is uh, are we done? And I think um, what Lucas just laid out indicates that we're not completely done yet. Right? There are a lot. Of, there's a lot to be proud of. Um, we are well established in, in civil society and enterprise and politics. Um, but there are still some problems that I think that remain unsolved. Um, the the COVID-19 apps um, show us um, that some aspects of open source, like reuse of code, work quite well. We see uh, Austria, Australia forking from Singapore or, or Belgium, German uh, forking from Germany. Um, but we don't, what we don't see here is a lot of collaboration on the actual development. And this indicates, um, I think, quite some potential to go from here. So we've learned to share but we've not necessarily learned to, to work together um, in the open source sense, for example, across countries. Um, also, we see you know, large companies that technically could be champions, uh, for example, in Europe, um, struggle the most in adopting open source. Um, and the small and medium-sized companies that like you just mentioned in, in the results, they, they kind of lead the way. Um, so there's a, still a lot to do. I think we've come quite far um, and we can be proud of the results. And, and the growth potential is amazing. Um, but I think there's still a lot of work to do. I'm not sure if you've uh, covered anything while I was off, but one of the areas I wanted to pick up, because going through the results, we didn't get a lot of discussion around open source hardware. So Andrew, you know, how far do you think open source hardware has come? Uh, how far clearly has it got to go? And do you think, what are the lessons you think can be learned from open source software? Um, particularly I'm thinking of some of the community and cultural aspects. 
Yeah, I mean, what's very interesting about open source hardware is that um, there is a really a very broad spectrum of, of what that means. So it can it can mean um, sort of anything from mechanical devices, very hard hardware um, that um, you know you need things like um, lathes and mills um, to create a large factory, um, right through to things that are much more similar to software. So this this would be, um, I mean, when people are talking about programming um, or configuring FPGAs, for example, using hardware description languages, um, then they will talk about that uh, being hardware as well. So what, what we've learned is that, um, you know, there is this vast spectrum from mechanical devices like trucks um, in the middle, somewhere you're looking at electronic devices um, that, uh, like Arduinos, for example, um, and then you're looking for, for uh, looking at things like open silicon FPGAs. Um, and the way that uh, the uh, all of the characteristics of open source software uh, that, that we've learned, they impinge differently depending on how hard the hardware is. So, and you can have um, a product um, like a project like Myriad RF, for example, um, that consists of FPGAs. So there's uh, communities that are developed around the uh, uh, the programming of the hardware description language to configure the FPGAs. Um, then you've got um, the, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the firmware and the software around those. Um, and then you've got the actual circuit boards themselves. And so they're on a, they're on a sort of spectrum of, of hardware. <laughs> Um, and uh, the, the open silicon area, I think, is the, is the most interesting one because that is, uh, in many ways, it is very, very similar um, to uh, open source software. Um, and uh, the sort of communities that will develop around open silicon, they can be very similar to the sort of communities that develop around open source software because a lot of the development methodology is very similar. You know, you can put your core designs on GitHub, for example. Um, you can have a community of, of, of people who are able to make changes to those core designs and they're able and the, the cycle that you have of uh, development testing and production is very similar to the cycle that you would have with development testing um, and production of software um, but uh, if you're talking about something like a circuit board then that that's that's very different and what, what we've what we've seen um, is that different sorts of communities will um, will develop so uh, the ones that develop around um, software and things like uh, um, uh, um, HDL um, programming, um, they're, 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 they're quite similar in that they sort of adopt the open, frequently adopt the open source ideas of release early, re, um, release release often. Um, whereas uh, there's a, it's been described as open when ready tends to be more applicable to things that are more at the harder end of the, of the hardware uh, scale. So this is something that the Open Compute Project has seen quite a lot, for example, where the designs are released, you know, once they're, they're developed using a fairly fairly traditional um, in-house development methodology, uh, but they are released um, uh, when they're ready, and then a community forms around essentially the, the, the completed designs. Do you see then that we're going to see the same sort of progress as we saw on open source, okay, open source software, or is this going to be something uh, on a much slower basis? Um, I think the most interesting area is definitely around open silicon, and I think that's where there is the uh, the, the, the biggest potential. Um, I think there are there are always going to be constraints because physical items are physical, and therefore they need to be made of atoms, and therefore you need to um, uh, look at a whole load of characteristics like you know the the actual physical physical tooling that you need, the feedstock, the environment. You know there are many many more potential constraints on the development cycle in the harder end of hardware um, than there are in the in, in the softer end, so I think the uh, I think the softer end um, has got an enormous amount of, of potential. That's not to say that there isn't potential um, in the harder end as well, but I think the dynamics are going to be going to be very different. Um, but they, uh, you know, there are uh, things do not necessarily have to be completely open. Um, in order to obtain all, all of the benefits. Uh, but what we've seen is the more open that things are, the more benefits that they obtain. And that's something that's possibly easier to attain um, at the softer end of the spectrum than it is at the harder end. Okay, now just moving on, because I know we've got, I've got a hard stop on this, I think at 20 past. So a couple of the areas that I did want to cover, and I particularly wanted to pick up the areas, I guess it's two areas of culture and skills. And that's something is potentially, I think, common across open source hardware and or open source software. Um, and I don't know if Newton Sachiko perhaps want to kick this off, is your views on that? Because on the skills that came out in the project, but for people who don't 
the background of open source software don't really haven't been into it um the cultural aspect is really quite a hard one to understand and i know it, it's something that is much less tangible to measure for some of the things in the project so i don't know if Nutter or satrika want to kick off on that and perhaps any of the others come in as well ladies first <laughs> Okay, um, then I, I, I take the opportunity to make maybe a slum, somewhat personal comment on this because I think we, we all know that, you know, to change, change culture, we need to start with the children. And, um, and I'm going to say here that it's not just about focusing on open source. It's really fundamental about focusing on, you know, young people becoming creators. Uh, ver you know, versus consumers. And I think um, a lot will be gained just by um, making, uh, you know, changing uh, early, you know, even early childhood curricula to, to um, you know, you see, uh, you know, it's not enough um, for, for Europe to bring tablets into the, into the, into the classroom. We need to, uh, we need to encourage programs where, where, where children learn how to, how to code. And I think, you know, in that, in that way, a lot will be, you know, and learn how to tinker with, with, uh, with, um, with things as well. Uh, I really think a lot will be won then. Uh, anyway, uh, Knut, do you want to come in? Okay. Uh, yeah, indeed. I think ed education should start uh, related to openness in general as, as soon as possible. And uh, because what, what we are going to face is uh, we have a, already a, a general problem regarding kind of skills and we have some demographic uh, issues, especially in Europe, we have, we have to face. And, and therefore, the, the competition for, for people contributing also to, to open source is, is getting is getting harder uh, that, that's 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 just from the from the quantities and uh, and therefore we, we have to to increase our uh, efforts regarding education on the one hand and and also um, I think we should get kind of a, a, a global coalition and uh, try to maybe rethink the the, the, the discussions or the trends we, we saw in the last uh, a few years to uh, where, where every country or every block uh, tries to uh, kind of yeah maybe close a little bit their their value chains. I think here open source is, is a way to to really keep these these value chains so up, you... open to to uh, to also to uh, to assure independence and and then we kind of we, we did some work on technological sovereignty and I think open source. Software, but also open source hardware is, is a very important element in, in assuring this technological solution. I'd like to add, um, what is the, sorry, Graham, um, on, on the aspect no, go on, go on. of education. Um, I think we've had a focus in the past more on, on teaching kids, well, how to use something that exists and, and basically look at it from the, from the surface. Um, uh, look at maybe marketable skills, which is necessary, of course, but not the only thing. I think what we, require is a shift to learning and teaching how things really work and that requires for the systems that you teach to be introspectable and and that means it's a matter of maybe principle more than cost and um, direct benefits of teaching not just about open source but with open source as well uh, it basically gives okay, that, gives the, the children the opportunity to dig as deep as they like to learn how programs and computers work. Okay, I'm keen. Though, is there anything specific in the study that you've made as a recommendation, particularly looking at the commission that you'd like to see them taking as a next step in this area? What I just said is at least stated in one of the recommendations. Okay, look, I, we're, I'm very conscious of the time. Um, I did want to cover one other area if we possibly can, and that is look at some of the globalization aspects. Uh, we talk quite regularly now about digital sovereignty, digital autonomy, choose your, choose your language for that. But again, are there aspects in the study that you think are important for the Commission to understand in terms of its and the, the, uh, the way that it, uh, it moves forward, in particularly with some of the recommendations. So I don't know if Nuft wants to come in here. Luke, you might want to comment at this point as well, looking at it overall, because you've had a wider aspects as well. Look. Well, I, I, can't, I can't say much about the study, but I, I picked up what I heard from uh, Sashiko in particular on the uh, 
open source program officers. I think that's certainly something one could pursue and, and the way they could throughout the EU could indeed be an element which could help and develop. I mean, there remains, of course, that on procurement, less progress has been made than, than I certainly think we had hoped for back in 2006. Um, and I think this has a lot to do, of course, with the, the lock-in, at least, the vendor lock-in, which occurred in many public services over the years. Um, I still, to come back even on the previous issue about education, uh, if you reflect on it, uh, I guess, differently from our, the countries we are in, uh, many of the countries have closed schools huh? or we have virtual education. Uh, it's For me, it still seems very strange that we don't have anything on public television, for instance, where we have, according to classes, open courses uh, using open source in, in particular areas. Why is it that every school has its own online program uh, closed, locked in just to its own students? Why don't we have just uh, MOOCs uh, as they were developed uh, at levels of different schooling um, and open to kids from different schools, etc. So all this is still an area where I'm amazed that so much progress could be made, but where the public Part of it seems to be tremendously lagging. Mm. Uh, just to, to uh, continue uh, one, one, one aspect, I think the, the big challenges, uh, what, what we are going to face then after COVID-19 is certainly the, the climate change and, and here I, we need global solutions and, and here uh, open source software, but also open source hardware can make uh, really a major, major kind of contribution in order to maybe tackle this challenge successfully as a global society. Okay, my conscience has appeared at the bottom of the screen there. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> thank it's you all for your waiting, yeah, you know. Yeah, it's it is, I guess, I guess, but he sits there, you know. <laughs> Chin. So, uh, but thank you all for your contribution. Um, it's a great shame, I think, that we haven't had a lot longer to, uh, time to go into some of the details. I think the the study is a fantastic opportunity for the open source community and hopefully the open source hardware community to develop and move forward. Um, and it's, I think, great that we've seen such good progress. So, thank you all. Asta, back to you. Perfect. Thank <laughs> you, Graham, Knut, Luke, Sacha Gromark, and Andrew. Um, and as Graham said, uh, it is a lot of information to digest, not just what's mentioned here today, but also just uh, okay. uh, the study itself is expansive. But we at OFE, and this is just a heads up, uh, we will host an in-depth event later in the spring um, to really discuss the findings where you can ask all the questions uh, um, that you might have. This will be around the time when the uh, final version is published. Mm -hmm.